great. We are in for a real treat next. This, this individual that nobody recognizes who's walking on stage because he's, he's wearing a tie and nobody ever has seen him wearing a tie before. It's Butler Lampson. I, your colleague said otherwise. Uh, he's the 1992 Turing Award winner. He's a Microsoft Technical Fellow. Uh, he's bicoastal. He used to be here in the East Bay, and uh, now he's uh, an adjunct professor at the Berkeley of the East, uh, known as MIT. Butler, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, and actually, just a word Oops. about questions for Oops. Butler afterwards. We're going to try an experiment. We're going to parallel process this. Uh, if you have questions, you want to put them on a question card, keep sending them up. But they're going to go directly to Butler, and then he can take his choice of just calling on people randomly in the audience or uh, you know, putting the questions to his forehead like Johnny Carson used to do and predicting the answer. So we'll, we'll be very flexible on this. Oh, I don't know. It's just a, it's just a computer. Is it going to come up as the big question? Well, while we're waiting to find that out, um, what I want to talk about today is uh, a very high level view of what computers are good for. And I've, I've described that in the following terms. Uh, there are basically three kinds of things that computers can do. They, model, they can model the world, they can connect people, uh, and they can engage with the physical world. So it's, when thinking about what computers can do, it's always good to have some context. And the context, of course, is Moore's Law. And everyone knows about Moore's Law. Things uh, get faster and bigger at a pretty rapid clip, whether it's uh, a factor of 100 every 10 years or a factor of 1,000 every 10 years. Depends on the domain. But this has been happening and it's continuing to happen. And it has some fairly profound implications for how you go about building computer systems. Basically, it means that you spend hardware to simplify software. You can afford to build the software out of giant components, only a tiny fraction of which is actually being used in any given application. And as the hardware improves, it enables new applications. And you push the complexity into the software. So what do computers do? Um, starting in the around 1950, we started to use computers to simulate things whether we use them to simulate nuclear weapons or payrolls or protein folding or games or virtual realities. The basic idea is the same. You build some sort of model in the, in the machine and you run it and it's supposed to tell you something about what goes on in the physical world. And that has been enormously successful and it continues to be enormously successful. Um, I'm not trying to say that the old uh, trajectories, the old applications, um, are, that's all finished and there's nothing more to do there. Um, but new things do come along. And around about 1980, the hardware got good enough that, that it started to become feasible to use computers to connect things, to, mainly to connect people with each other and in the form of storage to connect uh, uh, things in the past with things in the future. Um, so that, this has brought us email, airline tickets, online, books, movies, Bing, virtual earth, all kinds of great things. Well, it's been another 30 years and it's time for something new. And it's my belief that although simulation and, and connection are going to continue to be very important, um, the most exciting applications of computing in the next th 30 years are going to be uh, what I'm calling engagement. Computers engaging in non-trivial ways with the physical world. So this means uh, uh, com computer control uh, equipment in factories, uh, cars that drive themselves, robots, smart dust, um, a whole range of things. Another description, uh, another word for it uh, besides engagement is uh, embodiment, uh, giving the computers bodies. Uh, somebody, I think maybe it was Herbert Dreyfus, said long ago that, that for a computer to be intelligent, it would have to have a body. And I don't know whether that's actually true, uh, but um, I, I do think that computers are going to have bodies. Um, most of this talk is about what computers can do rather than about how they do it. Uh, that's not really my topic, but we, we'll be hearing more about that from people talking about programming languages and about architecture. And certainly we'll be hearing uh, more about that from Alan Kay this afternoon. So computers simulating things. What happened to the slides? Oh, there they are. Um, 
there are lots of examples. Here's just, I'm just tossing out one. Here's protein folding. Uh, you can um, try to figure out how the protein turns itself from a two-dimensional into a three-dimensional structure. Uh, connection, of course, we have lots of things, some a little bit difficult to illustrate, although one of them is right up there on that screen. But here's another one. This happens to be a, a, a map of, of the area of Cambridge, Massachusetts, where my house is. Um, more recently, we've been putting together simulation and, and connection in the form of big data. So we have computational science, uh, physics, biology, and earth science more and more depend on computers, not, not just to simulate things, but also to pull together large amounts of data to guide the simulations. Social networks, empirical economics, um, maps and route finding, and perhaps the most interesting to, in general, the idea that you can learn from large amounts of unstructured data, whether it's language translation or query optimization or any of a very wide variety of other things. Um, most of this talk is going to be about the, the new area that I see that, that is just getting started, which is computers engaging with the physical world. So here's a very early example from about five years ago. It's the Roomba vacuum cleaner. I was really pleased when this came out because for about 25 years I've been predicting that the next decade would be the decade of the household robot. And it was a complete bust until the Roomba came along. Uh, it's actually been fairly successful, and they've sold a few million of them. It's interesting to know that the original, this is probably not true anymore, but the original Roomba had 12 kilobytes of ROM. I believe every byte was written by Rod Brooks. And it had, get this, 256 bytes of RAM in its computing. Um, it was, this, this kind of gone out of style, but it was popular for a while to say, well, most of the interesting things in computing have already happened, and all we really, really have to do now is sort of um, polish the apple. Uh, uh, someone earlier referred to Jim Gray's uh, paper on what, what's coming next, and I've drastically uh, uh, boiled down Jim's 10 challenges for the future into these four various aspects of the Turing test, being able to read and understand, think and write, hear and see, as well as a person, being able to understand a text corpus well enough to, be, to answer questions about it, as well as an expert. Um, the computer can let me be somewhere else by implementing telepresence, which would be awfully nice. I wouldn't have had to get on an airplane to come here. I could, my my um, virtual avatar could be here instead. It would be, be um, much less hassle. Um, computer can learn to implement a specification as well as a team of human programmers. And we can learn how to build systems that can support millions of users with a tiny amount of, of human administration. Um, I'm not going to talk about these topics in any detail. This is, I think it's fair to say, for the most part, the relatively distant future. I'm, I'm going to talk about things that I th think are, are much more in the immediate future. Um, so to set the stage for that a little bit, uh, what are the big trends in computing uh, over the last few years and I think for the next few years? Well, obviously, some of these are things that everybody uh, puts on their slides. Connectivity, clouds and data everywhere. Ubiquity and invisibility. You have 50 computers in your car and, and half a dozen on your person and yada, yada, yada. Scaling, we have billions of users. We have billions of gigabytes of data. Uh, some things that are perhaps not quite so obvious. Um, Approximation, in, for many, many computing applications, the idea that you need to get the right answer is just not appropriate. Uh, good enough is good enough. I'm going to give some examples of that later. Um, I think it's a striking phenomenon that is, as yet, not widely appreciated by the practitioners on either side, but AI and systems are converging. And if we're going to really have engagement, <laughs> that's going to be essential. Um, Reusable components have been a dream of software engineering ever since Doug McElroy proposed them in 1968. They've pretty much been a bust for a variety of reasons, but actually um, very big reusable components can work. And that started to become clear about 10 years ago when it started to be routine that if you wanted to build a sort of white collar application, uh, you would build it out of the browser, a database, an operating system, uh, a program development environment very, very large components. And although your application is only going to use a, a small fraction of each one, um, it's still much better to use the big component than it is to try to build your own because they are so big. And now we're starting, I think, to see the uh, um, advent of 
some other big co components of that kind. An interesting example is the Microsoft Connect thing, which of course is not only software, it includes hardware as well. Um, it's sufficiently, it wor works sufficiently well and it's sufficiently cheap that you can, and it's sufficiently well engineered as, as a, essentially a plug-in thing that there's now already a sizable ecosystem of people using Connects to do all kinds of things beyond the specific purpose of letting you um, interact with games for which it was originally built. Um, and I think we're going to see uh, a lot of other compo components, especially in the domain of, of interaction with the physical world, components that can do speech recognition and understanding, or they can do vision and so forth. Um, it's now possible to build in the laboratory, at least, systems that are made by plugging together um, components like that, that, that 10 years ago were the subject of PhD theses. And you never could have built a system using one of those PhD thesis things as a component because it would just be too fragile. But now they've gotten to the point where, for the most part, you can't. They're not of shipping quality yet, but they're good enough that you can actually put together very interesting experimental systems uh, out of such things. Um, and finally, two topics on which I'm going to have more to say in a minute. Uh, one of them is dependability. Critical systems really have to work. And the other is uncertainty. Um, more and more, and especially if we're going to interact with the physical world, um, de dealing with uncertainty in the programs is, is essential. And we don't know very well how to do that yet. So let's look at some examples of engagement. Um, you can sense the world. So today we have GPS-based traffic information people carry around. Uh, in their cell phones, they carry on applications that rep report uh, how well their cars are doing. And you can turn that plus machine learning into pr predictions of traffic. Um, spoken commands and dictation, even boring systems like Windows have had this for five or 10 years. You could turn it on and try it out. Um, connect video commands for the Xbox, and as I said, lots of other applications. My dream along these lines is meeting room audio that actually works. Uh, and, and, this, this meeting is by no means exceptional in the fact that we have several pe people taking care of the audio and we still have lots of problems. Why we can't have automatic sp speaker and remote microphone and volume controls is a mystery to me. Oops. Um, understanding the world. Today we have a limited amount of augmented reality about people. So there's Al Alessandro Acquisti's project at CMU where he um, collected a, lo a lot of information that is publicly available and built a syst system that consists of a webcam that looks at people walking by in a corridor at CMU. And for about 15% of them, it can display their social security number correctly. Um, this raises a lot of interesting issues that I don't propose to go into. <laughs> but, it's, but it's an illustration of the current state of the art. In the future, something that I've wanted for a long time is a personal contact reminder. I have a very bad memory for people's names and faces. And I'd like to have a tiny camera that I wear and a little thing that sits in my ear. And it whispers to me, who, oh yeah, that's Jim. You met him six months ago at the, at the SOSP meeting. <laughs> well, we don't quite have that yet, but I definitely expect to have that within five years. Um, there have been some interesting experiments in intelligent interaction. Uh, if you have a computer with cameras and microphone arrays, arrays and you have a world model for some limited tasks, for instance, a, a receptionist, um, the machine ca can have knowledge of the object. It should be able to recognize and uh, internal models of the kind of scenarios that, that it's supposed to be able to deal with. And then it can engage in fairly plausible nat natural dialogue with people on such things. Um, here's something that's a little bit far out. Uh, it's the grand challenge that I came up with 10 years ago because I didn't like the sort of um, motherhood grand challenges that people were proposing. There was a fad for this. Uh, about 10 years ago. So my grand challenge is zero traffic deaths. And I think it's clear that this is a pure computer science problem. Because the only way that you can achieve this is cars have to drive themselves. And we already have all the mechanical stuff necessary for that. So all we need to do is figure out how to program it. It's simple. And it, here, here in the corner is a picture of a Google self-driving car with a red circle around it, at least the website from which I took it claimed that this is such a picture. Uh, for this, you need computer vision, you need world models for roads and vehicles, but also you need to be able to deal with uncertainty about sensor inputs, vehicle performance, the changing environment, what might, ha could a 
ball and a kid come running out into the street and so forth. And, and of course, you have to have a fairly high level of dependability. So people have been working on this problem for quite a long time, and they've made a lot of progress. Um, the DARPA challenge, <laughs> challenges were a, a good um, milestone, and I, I think the Google self-driving cars more or less represent the current state of the art in this domain. Um, my slogan is zero traffic deaths, because I think that's the way to sell it. You can't really be against reducing the number of traffic deaths. But actually, I think what's more important is that this will have just an enormous economic impact. And five years ago, I said it would take 20 years, and now I'm saying 15, so I think we're on track. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in the remainder, remainder of my talk, uh, before I uh, try to leave a few minutes for, for answering questions which I hope will be forthcoming, um, I want to talk about uncertainty and dependability. Dealing with uncertainty is unavoidable in the physical world. Um, the inputs are uncertain, and there's a, all kinds of complicated things going out there that you can make guesses about what's going to happen, but, but you can't be sure. So you need, to make this work, you need to have some good models of what's possible in the environment, and you need, you need some boundaries that will tell you when the models are, are not working anymore. Um, this kind of thing in addition to being unavoidable for, for um, sort of really intimate interactions with the physical world, like self-driving cars, it's also unavoidable for so-called natural user interfaces, like speech, writing, and language. The machine has to guess often about what's going on, and you have, have to figure out what are you going to do if it guesses wrong. So just an, a, a very sketchy example of how these things go. Think about speech understanding systems. Uh, you have an acoustic input, which is a waveform consisting of the speech you're interested in plus some noise. You compress, compress it and turn it into so-called features. Then you try to extract phonemes. You extract words using dictionary knowledge. You extract phrases using a language model. You extract meaning using a domain model. And at each of these stages, there's uncertainty that you have to deal with. And currently, we have a fairly good idea of how to do a lot of that in an essentially handcrafted way. I think the challenge is to figure out how to do it in a much more general way so that you don't need um, real um, supermen to, every time you want to deal with uncertainty. How should this be accomplished? Who knows? Um, one plausible guess is that we need to be able to deal with probability dist distributions as a standard data type. Um, obviously, they're going to have to be parameterized over the domain just the way lists are. What are appropriate operations? Um, I think this is a wide open area and one that, in which there's going to be a lot of progress because there are a lot of ideas and there's also a lot of demand. Um, the other aspect of, of building systems that, that engage with the world that I want to touch on is dependability. So what is dependability? Well, we understand, understand that talk about dependability formally. You write down a specification for the system and you, you uh, uh, convince yourself one way or another that the system that you built actually meets the spec. And we have a theory for doing that. Unfortunately, it doesn't scale to very big systems. And worse, um, in many cases of interest, we can't get the formal spec right. We can get partial specs right. right? The system <laughs> shouldn't generate any, any integer overflows or it shouldn't uh, um, dereference memory inappropriately. But the, partial, the correct way to think about the partial specs is they're a way of saying, when, when you've satisfied the partial spec, the system is saying to you, I'm sorry, I can't find any more bugs. It doesn't mean there aren't any more. Um, so the formal story, a lot of progress has been made, but we really don't know. Um, it doesn't cover the ground by any means because of the scaling and specification issues. Informally, what we mean by, by dependability is that users aren't surprised uh, by the behavior of the system. And of course, whether they're going to be surprised depends very much on their expectations. So people who use cell phones are not surprised by levels of service that would have been totally un unacceptable for a 1980 AT&T customer. Uh, and I'm not trying to say that's good or bad either way. I'm just pointing out that it's different. There's no um, law of nature that tells you what the dependability of a phone system ought to be. So how much dependability do we need? Well, you know, it varies. Safety critical applications are growing fast, avionics, medical devices, self-driving cars, lots of other things. For those, at least some aspects have to be highly dependable. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that applications that have no precise spec are growing fast as well. 
So search engines or the Amazon retail website, there really is no notion, no important notion of correct behavior. On Amazon, the only page that actually has to be right is the one that has the place your order button on it. And if you're an Amazon customer, you may have noticed that quite often a lot of the other pages are wrong. And that's a byproduct of Amazon's software development process, which prioritizes agility over correctness. And so that's not meant as a criticism. I think, I think they're doing the right thing. Um, we know a lot about how to do dependency by redundancy, which is good in its place, but of course it doesn't solve all our problems. For that to work, you need independent failures, which you usually can't get for software. So there's the famous story of the Ariane 5 European uh, uh, orbital vehicle that self-destructed on its first launch because of, a, of, of an essentially deterministic failure in, in, in part of the software which brought down both of the guidance computers. And independence is even harder for the specs than it is for the code. That's why N version programming has not been very successful. The other thing you need, of course, if you're going to have dependability by redundancy, is systematic test and repair. And we're not, that's another thing that we understand in principle, but we're not that good at doing it in practice. Um, another way of thinking about dependency is what you, one aspect of what you mean by dependency is that there should not be catastrophes. And this is a realistic way to reduce your aspirations by forcing you to focus on what's really important. So what's a catastrophe? It has to be very serious. When the USS Yorktown Navy uh, experimental automated ship uh, can't run its engine in the middle of the Atlantic, that's a catastrophe. Um, when medical equipment kills people, that's a catastrophe. How can this aspect of dependability be addressed. My take is that the way to think about it is that you, you have to address it architecturally. Um, what that means is normally you're going to run the system in normal mode, but when things get tough, you're going to fall back to catastrophe mode. And catastrophe mode is only going to depend on a very high assurance, so-called uh, catastrophe computing base, by analogy with the trusted computing base that, that security people use. Um, to make this work, um, you have to have clear, limited goals and limited functionality and, and a, enough of a bound on the complexity of things that you can have a high degree of confidence that it's working. Typically, people don't architect systems this way, and they don't like to architect systems this way because it requires making painful decisions about what's really important. Okay. So just to wrap up, um, conclusions for the scientists in the audience, we need to understand probability. If you think about what's going to be important going forward that's um, perhaps different from what's been critical in the past. We need to understand probability, we need to understand dependability, and we need to understand scaling because we need to be able to deal with lots of data, lots of connections, lots of concurrency. <laughs> These are things on which a lot of work has been done, but a lot of work remains. For engineers, um, it's critically important to understand Moore's law because the capabilities of the hardware fundamentally determine what applications are feasible. It's good to aim for mass markets because computers are everywhere. I think that engagement is the great new thing. Non-trivial interactions with, between computers and the physical world is going to be the, the most exciting domain uh, over the next uh, 20 years or so. And we need to learn how to deal with uncertainty and we need to learn how to avoid catastrophe. And that is the end of what I wanted to say. And I would be very happy to entertain Fabulous. questions if there are any. Yes, no, there are tons of questions. <laughs> so uh, give you a chance just to glance at some of those. And then also I'd say raise your hand. We'll run a mic to you. I just want to make the observation there's been a really interesting um, subcurrent all morning long about Stuxnet and Flame. And the questions have run like, well, what would Alan Turing think of Stuxnet and Flame? Uh, would he be writing Stuxnet and Flame or would he be writing the systems to stop Stux Stuxnet and Flame? I don't know if you have any thoughts, but it Sure, he'd be doing both. <laughs> he'd be doing both, yeah. That seems totally straightforward. I think in the, in the NSA, they routinely swap people between the cryptanalysis and the cryptography um, parts of the business. Um, so Don Parker asks, what about computers engaged in crime and warfare? That's a fascinating topic, but We're I'm not going there today. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <Don. laughs> that, would, that would fill up a whole session and more. Uh, what is the future of systems 
that destroy, all this fixation on destruction and security and cyber warfare and all those things. My personal belief is those things are really not that important. So let's do this. Let's see. Who has a happy question they'd like to no. ask? <laughs> Butler, raise your hand. I'll get the mic to you. Preferably up front. Good. We, right over here. Can, can we have Asimov's laws of robotics? That's a so, fascinating question. Bob, I have Bob. no idea what the answer is. Yeah, so Bob. Bob, Bob Kahn. There was a lot of uh, interest back in the early 70s in automatic programming. Uh, didn't meet my expectations. Maybe it met yours. I'm not sure. But with all the challenges that you've laid out in computing, knowing how poor people are at it, I would assume that having computers play a better role in programming all these applications would be one of the dreams. What do you think is the prognosis for automatic programming going forward? I think, I think certain kinds of, well, certain kinds of automatic program, programming we certainly already have by the standards of the 1970s. Uh, a lot, many, many kinds of programs are much easier to write now than they were then, and that's because of various forms of automation. But truly automatic programming, I write the spec, the computer writes the program, that still seems hard. Uh, the other tack on that, um, I'm going to leave to Alan Kay, who is going to be talking about this this afternoon. Good. Other questions? Uh, we can pick one off there. Show of hands. Just raise your hand if you have a question. Oh, I'm going to run, run one more down here. Okay. Tell us who you are. Uh, my name is Francis Shu. My question, uh, my challenge is, how can we know when a computer is having an orgasm? Well, <laughs> this is why I get paid the big bucks. Uh, I, I guess the answer is, if it's doing that, it's probably not, yeah. not doing what it's supposed to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps we can observe that. Okay. <laughs> um, while you're looking for the next guy on the floor, I'll just say, how do you deal with the transition to zero traffic gets? How do you get humans to stop driving? That's also a fascinating question. I think in the end, it, a lot of it will be similar to what we did with airbags. I mean, a lot of people were uncomfortable with the idea that they were going to drive around in cars with things that could explode in front of their faces. But it got accepted. Yes. Seems like very good. Sir, right over here. Yeah, so it seems to me that the effect of Moore's Law on personal computers has stopped about five years ago. In what domains do you see it still radically pushing forward? It stopped because um, we c couldn't get more single stream cycles. But if you want to engage with the physical world, um, first of all, you can have a lot more parallelism. And second of all, you need a lot more cycles. Um, I remember Ed Feigenbaum, 30 or 40 years ago, tried to uh, convince me that connect connectionism was the way to go. And he failed on that, but he said something to me that has stuck with me for 40 years, which is he said, we know the cycle time of the nervous system. It's about five milliseconds. And we know that in half a second, uh, humans and animals can perform rather complex perceptual tasks. We have no idea how to program a computer system, never mind how much concurrency it has, so that it can do those tasks in 100 cycles. But it, it's clearly possible. So I think we don't, we, as long as we can have more transistors, we can get closer to, to, to the brain in raw computing power, and it's a challenge to f figure out how to use it effectively. The fact that we can't have more single, lots more single stream execution speed, I think will not be so important for the things that I've been talking about. Good. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, somebody's sneaking up on you with a card back there. Question from this side of the room? Lots of cards. God, this audience has gone so shy. Hopefully you have a question up there you want to answer because otherwise we'll have to talk about robotic uh, orgasms more or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm implying with zero traffic deaths that computers can ultimately outperform humans. Absolutely. They're, they're, they're certainly much better at adding and I think there's every reason to believe that they'll be better than all, all, all but the, the very best humans at driving as well. Uh, absolutely. What are the implications for teaching computer science? Well, we need to... No, I don't want to get into that one. That, that's, 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 that's too hard. That's too hard. Um, do we want to keep pure mechanical physical systems as backup? Um, that's the issue that I was really trying to address with my comments about catastrophes. Uh, I think a, a properly engineered software system will be just as good as a mechanical system. 
Um, but it is a real, the fact that it's so easy to go wrong with the software system is a real architect, architectural and process challenge that I think we're, we have not come to grips with. Shall I stop? Perfect, perfect place to stop. Thank you, Butler. <laughs>